<laughs> okay, so um, the reason that we're here today is to share a little bit of information that may help you to better recognize when a patient that you are working with um, could be a victim of human trafficking. Now, when we get that sense, and we'll talk about this more later, that someone may be in trouble, we don't always know what the reason is, right? Um, there's lots of possibilities, but we want you to have this at least in your mind as a possibility so that you don't miss it and we can get that patient the resources that they need. So next, I'd like for all of the facilitators to introduce themselves, um, and we're gonna go in alphabetical order except me. Um, <laughs> so first I'm gonna hand the mic to Graciela. Hello, my name is Graciela Martina. I work in uh, STAC and I am the Victims Assistance Coordinator and I have worked, uh, I am also worked with uh, the Human Rights Center, and I go and do uh, freelance for the American Association of Suicidology, and I have worked with victims and survivors of uh, domestic violence and, and sexual violence, and also human trafficking. Hi, my name is Faith Moore. I am a nurse practitioner here at TMH in the urgent care. Um, this has become an uh, interest of mine as I'm pursuing graduate studies and um, thinking about some potential victims that I may have come across during my career as a nurse practitioner um, and thinking about what we could have done or what I should have done differently had I had the knowledge and skills to do so. So that's why this has become very important to me and I'm glad to be here today um, sharing information with you. Thank you, Faith, um, and good morning, everyone. My name is Robin Hassler Thompson. Um, I'm an attorney, and I'm the executive director of the Survive and Thrive Advocacy Center. Um, we're the local uh, human trafficking uh, point of contact, uh, awareness center, uh, victim assistance organization for all kinds of uh, human trafficking, sex and labor trafficking. We'll be talking about that as we go forward. Um, I want to take just a sec and let you know that we have some materials in the back. If you haven't gotten them, we have this information card, which sort of lays out some information, including contact information. We have these little sticky notes, which we'll talk about more, but we have those in four languages. We have information about our local coalition, and we have a screening tool, which we may have run out of this. I have an extra one here um, for you. I'd like to also take a moment to thank um, Faith for putting this together. It is a lot of work. We've had the opportunity to meet in the past. DAC uh, did trainings for all of our local uh, county health departments uh, recently, eight actually. And so it was during one of those trainings that we met and we're really gratified with all of your hard work. And we're very, very um, grateful to TMH for having this topic and this morning and all of you here today. Um, so as we go forward, if you have any questions, the other thing I like to do is just encourage people, if they do have questions and they miss something, to raise your hand. What we found when we do this training, and so yeah, you just got the preview that we've done this eight, well, nine, counting the other training. We, we train together a lot. We've done this a lot. We've done it a lot, and what happens is we complete each other's sentences sometimes, um, and we may skip something. So if you're confused or you want more information about something, please raise your hand. Let us address your question right away, uh, but we will have time at the end, I hope, for questions. All right? Thank you, Robin. So, and thank you, Faith, so much for putting this together. Um, we've been really wanting to do some trainings at TMH, and this is our first official one, so I'm very excited about this. I'm Suzanne Harrison. I am a physician in the community, family physician by training. I work at FSU College of Medicine, and I've been involved in the care of and advocacy for victims of violence across the lifespan all of my career. So when human trafficking uh, really came on the radar about 15 years ago, we really started working on that, and it's really become a passion of mine as well. So I'm glad to have the team building, and I'm really happy to be here. And I would echo what Robin says, to just ask questions at any point. Um, we'll end up talking about some slides more than others, but that's okay. All right, so just for the CME portion of this, or the CE portion for the nurses, um, we have no financial disclosures, no conflicts of interest. So this is our outline for the morning. Um, just real quick, quickly, we're gonna give you kind of the human trafficking 101 um, so that you know what we're talking about. We're gonna talk about recognition in the healthcare setting, the approach to the patient, 
connecting to resources in the community, documentation and reporting, and then we're gonna close with a little bit of advocacy, um, what you can do, um, whether it's for a patient or for your community, um, or for your hospital. And Robin's gonna talk through the objectives that meet the requirements for licensure. Exactly, so you all probably know as nurses that as of 2019, part of your licensure requirements are to have two hours of training on human trafficking. Um, these objectives cover the information that's required in Florida statutes for you to get that credit. So on our objectives, they are actually included in a lot of what um, Suzanne has already mentioned to you um, with the definitions of human trafficking, which be with, and the second most important thing um, sometimes the most important thing is to recognize the indicators of human trafficking. What you'll find is probably rarely a 100%, I know this is human trafficking when you see it, but um, what you'll do is you'll see some red flags and signs, so we'll be covering those with you. Um, we're gonna talk to you with role plays. Um, Suzanne and Graciela are going to do um, role plays. So this training will be very hands-on, that's our goal. We're not gonna be just talking heads for you, giving you lots of stats and facts. We want you to see how to actually approach someone who might be a victim of trafficking, both in the healthcare setting, and you'll be able to use these skills outside, and you'll see why that's important as well. Um, we'll talk a lot about community resources. I already mentioned some for you there. Um, we'll talk about ways to help um, victims. I will tell you that as our organization, the Survive and Thrive Advocacy Center, and many others around town, um, you are vital. Volunteers and support are vital to the way um, we keep this information out there. Um, and we'll also talk to you about reporting requirements, both in general, um, under Florida law, and specific um, how human trafficking pertains to, relates to what Florida law requires of you regarding reporting. Okay, so recognizing human trafficking, and this is what Suzanne mentioned is the 101 portion of this, which is what is human trafficking? So a lot of times we think about human trafficking, what do we think about? Um, who, who has an idea about when you hear human trafficking, what do you think about? A anything in the popular press, anything in? Um, the movie Taken. The movie Taken. So one of my colleagues does a, um, a presentation and she puts the trailer for uh, Taken up there on the screen and says, please don't believe this is what human trafficking looks like. Now, that is not to say we never see people kidnapped, but do we ever see special forces fathers retired, doing the rescue, do we ever see, and if you want to think about the statistics on who is trafficked, um, generally they're not well-off, white, um, moneyed uh, people traveling in Paris, uh, you know, snatched off the street. Not that kidnapping doesn't take place, it does. Um, but Hollywood has done a job on really misleading us a bit on what human trafficking is really about. It's clear that people can be kidnapped, but most of the time, uh, people are preyed upon. Um, we know that it does involve um, movement across international borders, which that movie did, but most often it doesn't. So, so it, you don't need to move somebody across a border to have human trafficking. Um, what we talk about a lot is something called victims being in something called the prison without walls or having invisible chains. Uh, the law requires that we think about trafficking not like in the olden times, if you will, um, in the days of our country's first original sins around trafficking and slavery, where you had shackles and bars and you know uh, physical restraints. What we see now is traffickers controlling people through coercion, through threats. So that's why somebody could not leave a situation, even though they might go to work with a cell phone in their pocket because they know if they make a call using that cell phone they could be hurt they could be deported their babies could be killed there could be any bad thing that you know is makes them vulnerable happens to them um, so that's why we think about trafficking in that way um, so you need to have three things for trafficking and they're depicted here you have to have the recruiting process so you have a sort of process that's laid out initially um, you have the means, what I mentioned already, force, fraud, or coercion, any of those three. Um, and then you have to have an end. What is the end for this? Some sort of um, forced labor, servitude, slavery, um, debt bondage. So if someone is brought here, say, into this country, stopped at the border, never put into any work, would they be trafficked? 
No, because they haven't been forced to actually perform that labor or service. Now, there is a federal law that's called attempt to traffic, or it's a, you know, there, that is an offense. But in, in this case, that wouldn't be. But, so you always have to have some sort of labor or servitude at the end. Um, in terms of the process, note that all these things, recruiting or harboring or moving, it could be any of those things. So when we started out, when Graciela and I started working at the Human Rights Center at Florida State, we worked on a case called the Cadena case. Um, and that, is a, a, that was an organized crime family from Mexico where you had somebody performing one job, the recruiter, the grandmotherly figure that went to the homes of the mothers and, uh, I mean, of the girls and said, please, uh, you know, give me your daughter. Let me bring her to Florida. Let me, let me give her a good job. She'll send money home to you. Um, we can get her there. She can start working in a restaurant and that'll be a great, you know, a great thing for you and for her. She'll get a little education as well. That recruiter then got the girls, handed them over to somebody who took them across the border, handed them over to somebody who had them in another, um, you know, in a brothel. And then people who then, in this case, raped those girls because they were forced to have sex. That person was also a trafficker. So any of those people were part, were, could be called traffickers. Know that too, in our society, a 16-year-old boy who forces or, or induces or asks his 14-year-old girlfriend to have sex with his friend, that 16-year-old boy is a trafficker. He's inducing somebody to commit a commercial sex act. And that child, that 14-year-old girl, is a victim of trafficking. Okay, so it doesn't have to be organized crime. It can be an individual, it can be a single case, and we'll talk more about how family members are regularly trafficking other family members. Any questions? Okay. One of the things we like to distinguish is the difference between trafficking and smuggling. Um, it's frustrating to do research in this area often because you see media, the public media, sometimes law enforcement, sometimes others, interchanging these two phrases, right? The best way to figure out if somebody is a victim of trafficking versus someone who has been smuggled is to get to the issue of agency, of who, who is doing this of their own free will, who has some say in what's happening. So somebody who goes to a smuggler and says, I want to get across the border, I'll pay you $5,000 or I'll pay you $10,000. That person has their own, they're doing what they want. They're saying, I need to go there, I'm going to pay you for this transaction. When I get there, I'm free to go, or I'm free to get money. If you make me give you more money, I'll figure out how to do that. So that's somebody who has agency about what they're doing. Now, they've committed a crime against our border, potentially, um, but you've got that situation. You see what I mean? There's agency involved. Somebody who's trafficked, might, it might start out looking like smuggling. I'm paying somebody $10,000 to take me to the United States from Mexico, say, or Central America. So I get here. And they say, oh, you owe us another 10000 And by the way, you have to work it off by working in my restaurant or in this brothel. Or you have to you know, do what I say or else. And then you get back to that coercion piece I talked about. Or else we'll harm you or your family or whatever. You, know, you have a debt to pay off. I'm going to dictate the terms of how you pay off that debt. And so then the person has no agency. Then you have total exploitation and control by a trafficker of a, of a victim. Does that make sense? So those terms are very different. So we'll hear somebody say, oh, they've just been smuggled. Well, sometimes you'll have a group of people who've been smuggled. There may be people trafficked within that group as well. Okay, good. Um, this, this is a lot of words. This is the basis that I want, is the only thing I want you to get from this. The law distinguishes sex and labor trafficking, but the more I do this work, the more I get mad at that. <laughs> because trafficking is the forced labor of one person by another. Whether that labor is forcing someone to commit a sex act or clean a toilet, that is forced labor, right? So what the law does is it divides it up. You know, the old saying about, you know, you look at sausage being made or you don't want to look at sausage being made or laws because they want to distinguish those two. What we see is we often see even juveniles who are sex trafficked are also forced into labor. Big study out of Arizona had kids talk about, or now adults, talk about what happened when they were trafficked as children. I was shocked to see how many of those kids were forced to perform labor. That labor could be illegal, like being a drug mule. It could be other kinds of, 
you know, uh, construction or any of the other stuff we'll talk about in terms of labor. But it, it wasn't all sex trafficking. And we have in our country this idea that human trafficking is sex trafficking only. And we're on a mission to, under, to help people understand forced labor is also out there. And by the way, don't think it's always just people who are, um, you know, maybe uneducated, undereducated. We've seen cases of nurses from the Philippines be trafficked. So if someone has a vulnerability, if someone, um, you know, is here and has something that, you know, makes them vulnerable, for example, in this country, in, those, in that case, educated, highly educated people were trafficked. Um, if you go back in just a second, trends. Labor trafficking is growing in terms of awareness. In our, in our country, Florida's third in the nation when it comes to human trafficking. We'll talk about that a, a little bit. But no, there's some intersectionality on some issues. We're seeing more and more. How many people remember a year ago, October, the little girl who was sex trafficked in Apalachicola on a houseboat? You remember that case? Her parents had sex trafficked her for 10 years, from the age of three to 13. Um, to support their drug habits. What we're seeing now more and more across the country are parents sex trafficking their children um, because they need to support their drug habits. And when we have this explosion of this opioid epidemic, the re there was a recent case here in Tallahassee where a nurse's aide who had become addicted to opioids herself started prostituting um, and was actually being trafficked by a man, a pimp trafficker, um, and she needed to keep getting the drugs. She put her daughter in it as well because she, she was so addicted. That's a trend that's happening in Florida. And of course, online recruitment is, is uh, possible. Um, the part about the, the other thing about that definition before I leave it too is just to tell you that um, the force, fraud, and coercion piece, a child can't consent to sex. So if a child is just induced, if a John, if a man, or anybody says to a child, I want you to have sex with me, I'll give you a roof over you know, your head tonight, I'll give you a meal, like the kid outside the library in Leon County, I'll give you, he wanted a happy meal, and some guy picked him up, and that was inducing him for the purpose of, um, of, of, uh, of sex. That was the that end, and that third box, and that other slide. We know that this is an incredibly prevalent um, thing that's happening. I mentioned that Florida's third in the nation. Um, the statistics can be overwhelming. Um, for over 40 million people are living in slavery worldwide. We know women and children are, in general, the most vulnerable. So you're going to see that. But I will tell you, in Florida and Southwest Florida and other places, we've had cases of men and boys being trafficked in labor and in other sorts of sectors, hundreds of victims per case. And so I, I tend to wonder exactly, when we say 75% are women and girls, I think it can vary and it depends. And no, too, you know, you can walk in a restaurant, you can walk by a field, you can drive down the street, you don't know that those workers aren't being trafficked because it's very hidden. So I always like to put a caveat on this slide saying, this is what we think. It's a very clandestine operation. Chances are there are tons more people that we know that, that are being trafficked. Um, and we've also seen an increase every year in reporting. Um, somebody, think, somebody had asked, you know, is that because there's more trafficking? And I, I tend to doubt that. It reminds me, if you remember what happened with domestic violence, for those of you who are my age, I'm, I'm 59. Um, but when we started working domestic violence, remember, people, the stats went up through the roof. And people, oh my god, there's so much more domestic violence. No. Um, people just started reporting it. They started seeing it. People started self-reporting it because it became acceptable to do it. You all in the healthcare profession started recognizing it. So while we're seeing sophistication in online, social media, all kinds of, of, of horrific ways that people are lured into and preyed upon, um, we're also seeing that this phenomenon in general um, is getting more attention because there are more reports and so there are great things happening in terms of more reports means more help to victims, which means more also justice for them and um, hopefully uh, accountability and incarceration of traffickers. Um, and also that it's a $150 billion industry. We know, as I said, we see traffickers who are organized crime as well as others. You can see when you look at this map that um, trafficking is all over the country. 
Uh, what we see often is traffickers follow major highways. So you'll see I-95, you'll see I-10 going across the, bo the bottom, you'll see the, co the sort of constellation of cases in um, the northeast, those orange cases are where there are more, more, um, more people being trafficked, but you'll see it throughout. Um, so let, let there not be any question. You know, I, start, I started doing this work, I guess, it, over a dozen years ago now with Graciela. I remember the first report that came out of the Human Rights Center at Florida State. We did a press conference with our first big statewide report. And what we kept, I thought people were gonna say, okay, what can we do about it? Then, like, the, press, the questions from the press would be, well, what do we, you know, who's most trafficked? Where are we gonna, you know, what are we gonna do? What's the role of business? What's the role of blah, blah, blah? And what people kept asking us was, you mean this is going on? You mean this is happening here? Now that was a dozen years ago, so I cut people slack totally. But I still get that sometimes, and I still get it here in our area. You mean that's happening in Tallahassee? I thought it was just like Atlanta and, and you know Jacksonville, Miami, Orlando. Um, well, clearly we have that. You can see across the I-10 corridor here, you can see the red, you know, the orangish uh, colors. You can see that what I mentioned about the highways because so often victims are carried on our highways, whether it's the I-4 corridor here in the middle of the state, I-95, et cetera. So it's here, and as I mentioned, we are um, third in the nation. Who is at risk? Um, any vulnerable person. So the last line on this slide is really what we want to have as your takeaway. And I would argue, probably we all have some vulnerability. We know if you lost your jobs tomorrow, you'd be economically vulnerable. And, and, or if you were here on a visa, and your visa was about to expire, you could be a student at Florida State. That would be your vulnerability. You could walk, that student could walk into the emergency department and look like she's dressed to the nines, but if her visa is expiring or has expired, she's incredibly vulnerable to somebody coming up to her and saying, um, you wanna work with me? I have a service I can, um, we just need to go out with a few guys, um, or, or whatever. So there's a vulnerability, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. Um, we're seeing, for example, traffickers target people who have developmental disabilities and other disabilities now because they are there. Runaway children, incredibly vulnerable. Um, in fact, there's some studies around, um, I don't, you know, how quickly it takes, a, and it is quick, that pimp, pimps and traffickers, when they go to bus stations, when they go down to Disney in the parking lot, when they go any place, and they see kids, they prey upon them. They go to malls. There are how-tos that some, some of these traffickers have done. Um, gangs prey on children. So we know that runaways are very, very vulnerable. We also know that um, substance abuse is a big issue, and if we had more than two hours, we could talk about all of the kind of, you know, permutations on this, but suffice it to say, if you see somebody who does have any kind of substance abuse addiction. Know that that correlates really highly with victimization, not all the time, but um, we see people who are, we, we, were, we did a training at Disc Village, and doing the research on that, I learned that traffickers actually go to AA and NA meetings. So why do you think they do that? They're targeting very vulnerable people, right? So that's how insidious and how um, premeditated and how um, soulless uh, the people who are trafficking are. It's all about the money, it's all about the greed, it's all about the control. And they're looking for people who have that vulnerability. And so you have that intersectionality. Sometimes victims, uh, a, a victim I heard testify, she talked about how you know, the drugs helped her endure you know, victims of trafficking are like victims of torture. They endure, and we'll talk more about the trauma, Graciela and Suzanne will. But what we do is we, you know, the drugs helped her get through it. So sometimes traffickers get you because you're drug addicted, sometimes they give you drugs to make you drug addicted, and then there are cases where women or men and children get out of it, and they, um, in order to cope with the former trauma, they become addicted. So you do see, um, trafficking. The other thing I wanted to mention, and they'll probably, I don't know if they'll talk about this, but often when we do these trainings, I have the sense that we always speak about, you know, there'll be people you'll see who are currently being trafficked, and you'll want to help them get out of the situation, which will, of course, happen. But we know of cases where people have been trafficked 10 years ago, 
and they're going to be seeing you with a constellation of health effects that you're going to go, what? What? You know, what was going on with this person? She might not be trafficked, or he might not be trafficked now, but he's having, you know, the impacts of that. So remember that that could be the case too. Okay. Okay. So who are the traffickers? As Robin was mentioning, traffickers can be, you know, family members, uh, neighbors, uh, diplomats bringing, uh, for example, somebody <coughs> that will work as a nanny, and then they slave the nanny. Um, it could be really, it's not a profile, I wish that there is something that we can see, but it's not. It could be really anyone. Um, you know, one, one thing that I have been seeing lately uh, is uh, the boyfriends. Uh, so somebody comes and uh, poses as a boyfriend, and ended up being a pimp for um, you know young young women. So uh, you know just just remember that uh, it doesn't look uh, somebody doesn't have to be uh, you know some specific type of profile. It could be really anyone. Uh, so how do how is the recruiting being done? Really. Uh, uh, one thing that I have been thinking is uh, that, well, uh, that Robin was mentioning, uh, in our uh, work as, uh, as uh, in the Cadena case, uh, the women were recruited by uh, the people in the, fam in, the, in the town. It was a small town in Veracruz. And uh, they were asked uh, to come and work, if they would go in and help the family. Uh, they show a magazine, like, I don't know, Vanity Fair or something in Spanish, and said, you know, this advertising on uh, soap, you could be this person. And, and trick them to think that they were going to come to the United States, work, and then go back and send money, uh, which that's exactly what didn't happen. Uh, other thing that I uh, that I saw lately uh, is that uh, jobs online. I came across as a job at um, well, somebody was reporting me uh, Craigslist had a job uh, it was supposed to sell services. Uh, this job was uh, interesting because this person needed to go uh, immediately pack her stuff uh, and leave town immediately. It wasn't any paperwork or anything. Uh, this person is um, resourceful and smart and did some kind of a background check on the company and the, the address where the company was. It didn't make sense. The company didn't make sense with the address. And uh, she started asking more questions about you know, I really don't want to leave town. Can you, do you have a job here that I can do? And, you know, this person was very suspicious, uh, said, you know, well, well, we do, but, you know. So she started thinking, why will they offer me to go out of town if they have a job here? So, you know, you never know. It is, I, I am not saying that I was uh, human trafficking, but it's possible. Correct list online. Uh, offering jobs. Also, uh, the recruiting with um, young men and women uh, going, as I was saying, a benefactor person uh, coming and help you. I'm going to help you with this. Do you need some place to stay? Do you need food? So I started like helping because I am a good person and ended up being later on not be that. I can then uh, make pictures of this, you know, victim, and and then you know, threaten and say I'm going to show this to your school, or to your family, or you know, uh, neighbors. And so then now you have to do whatever I I am telling you to do. So um, so then this is uh, is it could be really 
you know, somebody like uh, Robin was said to any vulnerable person. And of course, somebody that has been having abused or, or being in a situation, vulnerable situation, a runaway, somebody is keeping school, uh, uh, you know, immigrant that is, doesn't speak the language and is deaf, or any vulnerable person uh, could be recruited. I don't know how I'm going to be doing this with glasses and. <laughs> Okay, so then we have a, a little video that, that we want to uh, show you. I think the biggest kind of prejudice is this idea of choice and the idea around kind of who's a deserving victim, who's a real victim. Um, I think we're comfortable on some level with the idea of a trafficking victim who is chained to a wall and kept in a basement. Most children that fall in sex trafficking are not kidnapped. These are kids that could be just walking um, to school from home, and they are approached. They were lied to. They were told that they were going to be having a better life, that they were going to get everything they wanted, dresses, money, shoes, everything, and they end up having, having sex for, for $40. OK, so uh, why do they stay? Why do people stay? Why do you think they stay? in the situation, traffic situation. Exactly. You know, there, there are different things. It's uh, violence of, or threat of violence to the person or to the family. Also, uh, the, the trafficker doesn't have to be violent with that person, but that person is witnessing violence against others. That's what happens uh, with the survivors that I interview. Uh, with the uh, Kalina case, they, you know, a couple of the survivors didn't suffer that much of violence, but they witnessed a lot of violence. So that's another way. Um, and uh, the dead, dead bondage, for example, um, I, I would add in that they have a, a debt with a person, but actually it's an illusion because they think as soon as they pay, they can leave the situation. It's never going to happen. It's, it's, uh, this debt usually is going to go up instead of down. Uh, the trafficker is going to start uh, charging for you know, special food or, or you know, a punishment because this person did something or tried to say something to escape or something like that. It's going to go up. And uh, some of the uh, survivors that I have talked to, uh, they really believe that paying the debt was going to be the ticket out. So there is this constant illusion for a long time. And it ended up being, even if you pay the debt, you're going to be sold to somebody else. So it's never going to happen. Um, like I said, I need glasses. Well, one thing that is not, um, it's not in here is uh, they stay also for cultural and religious uh, uh, ideas. Uh, we have an example of somebody that uh, believed that uh, was uh, working in a home and the lady that was uh, you know, trafficking her cut a little bit of her hair, of the victim's hair, and kept it. Uh, in this case, um, in actually all cases, traffickers know about their victims. They, they are really, really savvy about who they have and what are the witnesses and, uh, you know, the vulnerabilities. And in this case, this uh, woman knew the cultural and religion of the victim, so kept the piece of the hair, uh, keeping her with, you know, in the house. And it really doesn't matter if it is true or not for us. What it matter, matters is that the victim believes that that's, you know, uh, a need, that was an issue to, to stay with the trafficker. Um, and, uh, oh, you know, the, it depends on the person. It is, uh, could be threats of deportation at the beginning. Uh, we had uh, also this, uh, this case uh, later on um, where the people were uh, afraid of being deported because 
they knew they needed to pay the debt and then they will start a new life. Uh, so then they didn't want to be deported. Which in later on in other cases ended up being like I prefer to be deported. But that's you know, that has to be a lot of time after that that comes as a, a, a cross. Uh, also remember the Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, so then this uh, bonding, this unhealthy bonding with the person that keeps you there is, uh, well, like I said, uh, unhealthy, but this person will stay there. And I have to say that uh, some uh, women that I have met, uh, it is, uh, I see the consequences, and uh, Susan, Dr. Susan Harrison is going to be talking about trauma too, uh, where even after months and years, uh, the, some of the women that I have interviewed or, or work with, uh, they still feel that, that that was, you know, on, I, I would say unfaithful or, or being bad for them to accuse this guy and you know, the trafficker. So they still, there's still after months and years some kind of uh, bonding, unhealthy bonding. Um, and, thank you. Just really, um, we're gonna talk about some red flags and we just wanna really increase awareness so that if you encounter a victim who is currently being trafficked or who has been trafficked in the past, you at least put it on your mental list of things to think about and ask questions that would be relevant. So can we go to the next slide? All right, so why do we talk about this? We talk about this because the research tells us that even with people who know about human trafficking, who have been trained in human trafficking, we are still missing the signs. And we are frequently missing um, young women and men who come through the emergency rooms who have been trafficked, sometimes even coming in with an illness or an injury that is related directly to the trafficking or the violence that they have um, endured. And so this lack of training is kind of what led to this, the development of these types of trainings so that we can share the message. And really, you know, I said at the beginning, maybe you'll be ready to join us for the next one. We really do want you guys to investigate and learn and join the team so that you can advocate for these patients. They are so vulnerable, so needy, and really cannot share their stories in the 10 or 15 minutes that they might have with a provider, which is the reason that the whole team needs to be trained. It can't just be one person. There was a study that was published now almost four years ago, um, or maybe just over four years ago now, because it's been a couple months since I've done this training, um, that was published in a law journal, actually showed that um, uh, they interviewed all the women who had been, um, who had escaped the trafficking situation. These were all women who were sex trafficked. And 88% of them said that they had been seen in an emergency department or by a healthcare provider of some sort during the time they were trafficked. No one was asked. Not one single person was asked about being trafficked, about violence, about abuse. And you know, we scream for these things, right? We're still missing it because you have to do it right. You have to ask the right question at the right time, in the right setting, without other people around. Right? You all know that. I'm seeing heads nod. Um, this quote comes from um, a victim that um, said, during the time that I was from this study, during the time that I was on the street, I went to hospitals, urgent care clinics, women's health care clinics, and private doctors. No one ever asked me anything and at any time I went to a clinic. And then we have a survivor, a different person, who's gonna speak about her interactions with health care providers during the time she was being trafficked. I think doctors have a certain idea of what a trafficking victim is. They think it's usually somebody who's a minority or somebody who's from another country or somebody who has no family or in foster care. So I think that it just, it didn't really enter their mind even as I was more open about what was happening. All right. So what are the barriers? These are real, right? We all have really busy jobs, tons and tons of patients to see, to triage, to care for, to, you know, to do their discharge paperwork. It seems like it's a never-ending list of tasks, I'm sure. So that's a real barrier. Whether you are a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a social worker, an educator, or any person in the wheel that is caring for these patients, because we all touch their lives at some point when they're here. 
Um, we really have very brief interaction times. Um, these patients can be very resource and time intensive. Um, it's, you know, there, there, is, there are a group of people who say, I don't want to ask this question because what if they say yes? Then what? Then what do I do? Well, what you do is you find, you, you find your resources, Graciela, Robin, you call people for help. You have a trained social worker in the emergency room who's sitting in the back <laughs> who will, is ready and willing to help you. Um, you could do a brief sa safety assessment, understanding that you've still got, what, five, ten other patients to see in the next 15 minutes. Um, and, and we do know that those are real. There's also a group of people who may have been abused, may have a history of sexual assault. They may be the abusers. And those barriers, those very real barriers, can interfere with their ability to really connect with patients. And so if you are that person, if you have been trafficked, and I've done lots of these trainings where physicians have come up to me at the end and said, now I realize that I was trafficked as a teenager. I didn't, I know I was abused. I've always known that. But I, I couldn't put the label on it. So, but if you are that person, recognize that you may either have more empathy and a greater ability to deal with these patients, or you may have diminished capacity because it is so painful for you. Recognize that and make sure that you've got a colleague that you work with who can pick up the pieces when you've identified somebody that maybe needs more questioning and you really just don't have the emotional capacity to deal with it right now. It's okay, we're a team, it doesn't matter who does it. All right, and then there's this culture. In America, we have this culture of hypersexualization. You can't look at a magazine or a television ad with something being advertised through sex, right? I mean, most recently it's been perfume ads because it's Christmas, and they are ridiculous. I was watching television with my husband the other day, and he said, I don't understand this commercial. I understand that they're selling sex, but what's the product? Because he really couldn't tell, <laughs> um, which is, um, both funny and sad at the same time, right? Um, but it's the power of the advertising. Um, we live in a culture where we blame prostitutes, right? We say that they're prostitutes. We label them rather than saying, this person has been prostituted by another person, right? Someone else is controlling her or him. And so we blame the victim rather than the person who's controlling them. And so we live in a culture where that's been normal. We also live in a culture where we don't readily punish the people that are buying sex. We don't readily punish the companies that are trafficking people for labor. Because, you know, they're making money. It's part of the economy. And the economy is really important for, you know, for a healthy America. We've got to make America great again, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're not going to punish these people because it's economics. And that's important. And so until we get past this, we're going to continue to have problems. And then there's the history of slavery in the United States, which is a horrible, horrible part of our history, right? It's this big black eye, but it didn't stop, right? It's still happening. There are people who are being trafficked um, in town probably right now, um, whether it's for labor or for sex or for both, which is common. We have another video for you. This is a survivor talking about her reluctance to disclose in the healthcare setting and why. I think this is Sarah again. Just make sure you're paying as much attention as you can because sometimes these, these girls are, are going through very difficult times and you would never know. And they want to speak out, but they're too scared. I didn't really feel safe talking about it because for me in the medical, the medical field has always, whenever there's anything that's remotely criminal, there's always police involved and I don't have good experiences with the police. As long as she feels safe and she knows she's not going to get in any trouble, you can have her speak about a lot. If, if I was just been able to feel safe and comfortable, I think I would have spoke out. By the way, both of these young women, real people, not actors, um, are out of the situation now. Um, it took a long time and going in and out several times for both of them. Yes? Is it common for um, victims to be alone when they come to the it is not, so that's a really good question. I don't know if you can all hear it. She, um, she asked if it's common for victims to be alone. So just like with any person who's being controlled by another person, it's often difficult to get the other person who's doing the controlling away from them. Um, and when you sense that, you don't know what the reason is for the control, but you know the control is wrong, 
right? And so I'm sure you have lots of ways that you've devised over the years for getting people apart. And I would say, use them, manipulate people, do whatever it takes to get people alone. Don't ask these questions that we're about to talk about in front of another person, right? Because you increase their risk of serious injury or even death when they leave, regardless of the type of abuse we're talking about. Okay, so Graciela is gonna to talk to us about some of the red flags that you might wanna look for. Thank you. Okay, so uh, when a patient comes and has a history or, you know, is talking about histories and the accounts, uh, and those ones doesn't make sense, <coughs> and there is discrepancy between what they are saying and what you are observing, right? Uh, there is a possible a kind of a script story uh, that it is kind of, it sounds like it has been rehearsed or it's too short or it's something about the, 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 the story. Uh, for example, the clothing doesn't make sense with the weather or with the age of the person or what the, the person is working. Uh, it says that it's working in a farm, but it has other type of clothing. Um, the age is not consistent either. Uh, is, it looks younger than what the person is reporting, for example. Uh, it is unable to, to say where this person lives and you know what is the address. Um, in the, some of the, um, the survivors, uh, they didn't know. They, they really didn't know where they were. And, and why is that? Why, why do you think they don't know where they are? I'm sorry? Yes, exactly. So they move them around. The traffickers move them around. And in, in a, when it is a, somebody from another country and they don't speak the language, then the word Houston doesn't, doesn't mean anything, right? Or this person could be from the United States, not English, but it has been so uh, droggy all the time that they don't, really don't know where they are because they have been moving them. So they don't know the address and sometimes they just go like, oh, we're just visiting here. Um, there is unusual uh, number of, of sexual partners or uh, is too young to have a sexual partner. Like, um, do you want, do you say that that, that that accounts really well with the women that, I don't, don't remember in one, what hospital they went to get some. Oh, the health department. Oh, health department. The health department came, there were two women, two really young women, two or three. Two girls. Two girls, actually. There were no young women, girls. And they came to get, according to the family member, um, some kind of vaccine not to be pregnant. It's not vaccine for anything else, but not to get pregnant. So, you know, those are <laughs> a big red flags. Um, so, and then you see things like, uh, you know, dehydration, malnutrition, uh, uh, some kind of trauma, uh, whether it's physically or you start noticing. The person also can uh, become or look like really worried, secretive, you know, looking down. You, you start feeling something, it doesn't make sense. You want to add something? Huh? I just want to add that I think for me, one of the things that gives me the biggest clue, and again, I don't know if this is trafficking, but when you're talking with a patient, and if they have a script that they come in with, and you ask a question that's off the script, and there's that split second of hesitation where they don't know the answer because it wasn't what they were told to say, that's your in. That's when you know that this is a script and you can ask additional questions that may not be related to what you're asking about currently that can help you dig deeper into the story. Okay, so things that are unusual. And then to add to that too, um, we've been acting, we've been talking about acting, we've been talking about trafficking as a single thing um, without talking about the sort of co-occurrence of things like partner abuse and trafficking and sexual assault. So you could have somebody here who is being trafficked by their boyfriend, him, who would legally qualify to be 
you know, a victim of, of uh, domestic violence because they might meet that because that's intimate partner abuse, that kind of rape. Um, and know that two domestic violence abusers traffic their family members, both their partner for sex, their children for labor. Um, it is not uncommon. So uh, everything you've learned about domestic and sexual violence and all that training you've gotten just is so beneficial to what you're learning now. And what Graciela and Dr. Harrison just talked about, how these red flags will appear, again, you're not going to know, oh, this is definitely trafficking. Oh, this is definitely domestic violence. You will know, oh, this person is definitely being controlled. So then you start to dig down and say, it could be this or this or this. We hope after today you'll say, instead of, oh, it could be domestic violence, or this could be somebody who's raping her, or this could be something around prostitution, you'll be saying, oh, and this might also be trafficking, or it could be that. So that'll be now entering into your um, frame of, uh, of reference. OK, so somebody was asking about the, the, the person that would accompany the, the patient. Uh, so uh, what? What I have uh, um, heard from the survivors and you know from the research that we have done, um, so the, the the traffickers accompany uh, the victim, okay, and of course this trafficker doesn't want the victim to to talk about the situation and what is happening or anything. Um, so you they don't they don't they want to be with the victim at all times. So it's like, no, 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 I have to translate for her or for him, uh, or I have to be with, with them, or, you know. Uh, uh, doesn't allow the, the, uh, the patient, in this case, to answer their own questions, or uh, the patient turn around and see what the trafficker wants him or her to do. Um, uh, if you let, uh, you know, if you separate them, and hopefully by then uh, you understand, like uh, Dr. Harrison was saying, do not ask questions in front of the trafficker uh, because you can put the, 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 the patient so much more at risk. If you uh, let them finally separate them, uh, the trafficker will be texting and calling and uh, one thing that I am very afraid is he might also train the, the victim to keep the telephone on as a speakerphone or as a uh, taping to see what it was said. So I guess uh, the policy of no telephones in here are allowed. It's probably safer for, uh, for the, the, the patient victim. Uh, and um, other other thing is that uh, the person that you are seeing doesn't have any control on their IDs or paperwork or mm, doesn't know uh, where are those documents that you might probably ask for. The trafficker is the one that might answer that. And even if you are in a store and you start feeling and thinking that something is not right. One of the things that you can see is that the, the, the controlling person will control uh, where is the, 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 the victim looking at. The victim will not have money, will not have access to pay whatever, will not pick uh, what is. And I'm saying this because I'm talking about also uh, other victims when you see around. Uh, there is, when there is somebody controlling, uh, the, the whole thing about the victim. It is something, something is going on. So now let me uh, give this microphone to Faye. And I can pause this, thank you. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the behavioral um, indicators that you may wanna look for. And as Robin mentioned earlier, a lot of these indicators um, are gonna be similar to what you would be looking for with domestic violence. And I know that we've all had training in domestic violence. Um, so some of the things are if the patient appears anxious or fearful, they're not making eye contact. Um, a lot of times these indicators are things that as a nurse or as a provider that you're just going to get a feeling about in a sense from your patient. Um, and that's something that you don't want to ignore if you have that feeling that something is not right in the way that your patient is behaving. Um, that may be a reason to 
start um, questioning about red flags and, and investigating more, could this possibly be a human trafficking victim? Um, other behaviors, depressed mood, um, wanting to harm themselves. Um, a lot of times, you know, there may be an underlying reason for that de depressed mood, and we may need to ask more questions about that and not ignore it. Um, substance abuse we touched on, that is very common, whether it's um, they're being trafficked for substance abuse or being given uh, drugs to, to deal with uh, the trauma that they are experiencing. Um, and then a loose sense of time, not knowing where they are, what time it is, what day it is, um, because of the you know, repetitive nature of the trauma and, and whatnot. So sex trafficking indicators. Um, it's not uncommon for victims to actually be branded by their controllers. Um, one way that they are doing this is tattoos. Uh, it may not be so easy to, to know what tattoo could be a sign of trafficking, but there are some very unusual ones that have been recovered on victims. Um, ones that sometimes look like a serial number or a barcode. There have been money bag signs, um, sign, money signs. You can see here this picture up on the right where someone has been branded inside their lips, so that it is secretive and, and not so obvious. Um, another thing that's kind of new is the RFID tags. Uh, if you have a pet and you go to the vet, uh, the microchipping is something that's been going on for a while with pets. Well, the traffickers have actually um, been able to get a hold of microchips and place them inside of their victims in order to keep track of them. There was a case a couple years back where a victim presented to the emergency department and was claiming that there was a chip inside of her. Unfortunately, at the time, a lot of the nurses and physicians felt very skeptical about this story. Oh, she's crazy, she's making this up, of course she doesn't have a chip inside of her, but reluctantly they order an x-ray and sure enough, there's a chip inside of this patient and she was telling the truth. So it goes back to listening to your patient, not passing judgment, and, and really being open to the idea of what they are telling could be true. Um, uh, speaking about unusually high numbers of sexual partners, we do have a lot of people who come in repeatedly to the emergency department or the urgent care for gonorrhea, chlamydia testing or treatment because they know that we do empiric treatment a lot because we don't follow up. And when there's someone who's coming over and over and over again, you might want to ask more questions rather than being frustrated that, you know, oh, this person is returning repeatedly. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about labor trafficking indicators. Uh, this is <coughs> some of them, okay? Uh, usually, uh, but not always, uh, the, the, the victims live in the same place where they work or the, their uh, living arrangements are made by the trafficker or someone related with the trafficker. So, so then this way, uh, I guess they have the opportunity to charge as much as they want for, uh, for living arrangements. Um, the equipment, if any, that the, the, the victims are using for the type of work that they are doing is not appropriate or not existence. Of course, they are not going to protect or, or invest in any equipment or appropriate equipment for the type of job that they are doing. Um, there is also um, the, the um, I was just mentioning that before. Um, the, instead of the dead going down, it goes up. So somehow, if you see somebody that you know owes money, and then the next comes back in the next two or three months, it owes more money. There's something going on there. Uh, of course, it's not going to be any. Uh, investment on food and water. So uh, you will see uh, patients, as we have mentioned, uh, with uh, problems of mal malnutrition or even injuries that 
that have been old and never were taken care of. Um, you are going to uh, see probably people that have been uh, abused and, and threat of being abused and might, you know, somehow will come up in the conversation that, well, you know, I don't want anything to, that my mother, something happened to my mother or, or, or to my siblings. Uh, and uh, I think that's it. Let me make up the uh, water. Yes. On the, on the point of the last one about being abused at work, one of the things that Hollywood actually did well, there was a, store, a series on TV called American Crime. And anybody ever watch that? It's pretty good. And they did a whole season on human trafficking of both sex and labor trafficking. Um, if you recall in that, that season, the women who were labor trafficked, who were picking um, the vegetables and stuff by day, they were also being raped by the crew bosses. In fact, they had a name for it. They said, we, we have to go to the Green Motel. And when you saw that happening, you realized that sexual harassment and abuse for women who are working in the fields or working in any kind of labor condition but almost was one-on-one. -on -one. It just happened all the time. And a lot of the advocates that work in this area work really hard to um, to identify and to eliminate conditions of sexual harassment in the workplace. Because at the very, that's like, the harassment can be, you know, what we know as sexual harassment, demeaning um, behavior, touching, et cetera, but also can be um, all the way to the extreme of sexual assault and rape. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about um, approach to the patient. So you've got a patient that you are worried about. You don't know what's going on. That's what we're gonna talk about now. So. Let's go on to the next slide. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about, from the victim's perspective, what they may be feeling, thinking at the time. So these, I'm gonna talk first about sex trafficking because I think it's a little bit easier to conceptualize and for you to understand how they might be feeling. They might be very fearful, they've been threatened. They might be really ashamed of what's happened to them um, and they don't want anybody to know about it because they don't wanna be judged. Um, we are a society that, you know, despite our best efforts, we are very judgmental. And anybody who doesn't look like us, act like us, think like us is the other, and we are judgmental of them. We need to be careful, back up on that, and recognize that these people have had no control in their lives, and they really need us to meet them where they are, um, rather than making often incorrect assumptions about what their history is and what their life is. We don't know their story. And so understand that they may not trust us, right? Um, and you know, pull up a chair, sit down, don't take your history um, standing up across the room near the door where it looks like you're gonna leave or bolt in any second. I see somebody smiling in the background like, I know what she's talking about. Um, they also know that they're not gonna get very much time, right? So they've been to the doctor before, they've been to the ER before, they know that they're gonna wait for hours in the waiting room and then they're gonna see a nurse for a few minutes and a doctor even less, right? Pretty accurate. I've been to the ER here, I know what it's like. Um, they also may feel, and Graciela touched on this earlier when she talked about Stockholm Syndrome, but imagine the situation where the patient was recruited by a pimp who um, posed as a boyfriend, right? And she had lived, you know, we'll pick an American citizen, right? Somebody who's lived in an abusive household, who maybe was um, sexually assaulted by a family member while she was growing up. She's got a horrible life, right? Um, very few resources, uh, very little support. And then this guy comes along and he says he loves her. And he gives her a new phone. She's never had one and he buys her pretty clothes, and he gives her a place to live. And they have this loving, tender relationship for you know, two or three weeks before he starts pimping her out, right? But she's developed that bond that she really hasn't had with anyone else. And so that is called traumatic bonding, or Stockholm Syndrome, where she begins to identify with her captor, with her pimp, with her trafficker, whatever label you decide to use. Um, and so she really doesn't identify as a victim. Um, so in these cases, and with all patients, we really need to employ trauma-informed care um, in our 
approach to every patient, but particularly in patients who seem to be controlled by another person. Um, we have all in this room suffered some type of trauma in our lifetime, and that impacts our healthcare in some capacity. Um, it may be a reluctance to disclose, it may be lack of understanding of the association between the past trauma and the current situation. But if we approach every patient with those principles, um, we're more likely to be able to serve them well and understand what's going on. And we're not going to delve too deeply into that because we could do another two hours on trauma-informed care. We have another victim that's going to talk about how she didn't identify as a victim. I didn't really see myself as a sex, a sex trafficking victim until I was around 20 or 21. I didn't really realize because when I was working on the street, you really feel more like a criminal than you do a victim. So imagine her coming in, right? She doesn't trust authority. She is afraid you're gonna call the police about one thing or another that she's done and she's had bad interactions before in a previous emergency department. It's gonna be really hard to break that wall between you and her to get to the bottom of the story. All right, so I want to explain a little bit about how traumatized some of these patients may be. So we're gonna use sex trafficking as an example because these patients will often present more like victims of torture or victims of war than they do um, victims of abuse. So it's like 10 times, 100 times worse. So I just want you to imagine, and this is just an example, this is not what they all look like, okay? But imagine you have, first of all, how many people in the room have taken care of or known a person who's been raped? I don't believe you when you don't raise your hands. <laughs> all right, so imagine a person's been raped and they come to the TMH emergency room and it just happened. And so under the best of circumstances, um, they call a sane nurse, right, who does a forensic exam. This person gets a forensic interview. There's a chain of evidence. There's a victim advocate call, somebody like Graciela, um, who is going to walk this person through the resources that are available to them, right? Um, so that's what happens with a rape under the best of circumstances because it never happens under good circumstances. Um, and, and then think about how long it might take for that young woman or young man to get over the trauma that they've endured. Probably never, right? Back to the trauma-informed care, right? Um, it's almost impossible to recover from something like that, even when all the resources are rallied. So then you imagine a patient who is being trafficked for sex. In southwest Florida, they often have 40 to 45 buyers a day. I know this slide doesn't say 40 to 45, but that's what the numbers look like in Southwest Florida. And they don't have any days off, so they're being raped repeatedly in the same cot all day long and then expected to sleep on that same cot, and then it starts over again the next day. Now there are some situations where there's relief, where they get a few days off. There's, there's, um, People who are trafficked and then have some bonding with their trafficker um, may get a few days off, they may get to go do fun things, and so that makes it even more complicated. And then how do you recover from that, and how confusing could that be? This is the person you're seeing in your emergency room. I don't know how you're gonna break through that. You're gonna have to sit down, talk quietly, and just really get to the bottom of their story, meet their needs first before you satisfy your own medical agenda. That's the plan. Okay, so general approach, and you all know this, I am preaching to the choir, I know, that you will, at some point during every encounter, every encounter, make sure that you interview or examine the patient alone without whoever came with them. Make it a policy, adhere to your policy. Um, it is sometimes challenging to get that other person out of the room, but most people who are coming with them won't follow them into the bathroom. And I don't know about you all, but I am not embarrassed to follow a person into the bathroom and then ask them questions. When I was in private practice, my nurse Trina, she did that. And we had a nice big bathroom that was right by her desk and she just went right on in with them. I didn't ask the questions, she did. Again, doesn't need to be me. I don't need to be the leader of the team. Whoever is the right person, that's who should be asking the questions. You can order tests, you can make up paperwork for them to fill out. 
People who are controlling another person love to fill out paperwork and be in control. You can pull them aside and say, oh, I just have a few more questions for you. Do you mind? I don't want the patient to hear, but could you come over here? And then send somebody else in to ask the questions that you want to know. Again, doesn't have to be you. Um, if you've got a person, so back to what Graciela was talking about with the person who appears much, much younger than their stated age. And you all know what I mean, right? It's the person who says they're 20 and they look 12 and you know it when you see it. Go to the computer and check, check the FBI Missing Persons Database, see if that picture pops up. They're doing it in um, Cleveland, and they've been very successful. In the first several months, they identified seven young people who were on the Missing Persons Database. And they were able to reconnect them with their parents and had happy endings to almost all of the stories. Of course, before they started doing this, they didn't think they had trafficking in Cleveland either. Um, be truthful with your patients. So we often want to say, oh, this is completely confidential. I'm not going to tell anybody. I won't write it in the chart. Don't lie to them. They have been lied to so much. Tell them the truth. Explain to them what the limits of the law are and that you are a mandatory reporter, giving them the choice to not tell you what's going on. Yes, we want to identify them, but we do not want to put our patients in more danger. Do you want to add to that? You usually want to add I to that. I have a slide. You have a slide. OK, all right. And then I think this is the most important thing. Let the patient feel like they're in control, in control of the interview. Let them tell their story in their own way. Let them narrate it in their own manner. Honestly, you know, it seems like it takes longer, but it really doesn't. I've taught, had my students time me, you know, like asking questions off their first year medical student checklist versus asking a question and letting the patient talk. And it takes me about four seconds longer to do it where the patient's in control and I'm not asking questions. It doesn't sound like an interrogation and they feel better about it, right? Because they got to come in and tell you what was wrong and what was going on. Um, if there's a part of the exam they don't want to do, you know, it's their health care. Don't do it, right? It let them be in control. Um, and then understand that they might not be aware of their rights and you might need to explain those and reiterate the confidentiality, reiterate their rights over and over and over again because saying it once is not enough, okay? So now we have a couple of role plays for you. I do not know what Graciela is going to say. She surprises me every time. <laughs> so, hi Graciela, I'm Dr. Harrison. It's nice to meet you. Yes, yes, yes. What can I do for you today? Um, uh, my, my arm, um, I think I have something in my skin and I need to work. Uh, it's right here. Okay, great. So we'll definitely take a look at that. Oh my goodness. What happened? It, it just show up. Um, this is just show up. I think uh, I am allergic to something. Okay, do you have any spots like that anywhere else on your body? A little bit in here too. Let me see. Okay, it doesn't look quite as bad. All right, when did that happen? Uh, about one week ago. All right. So can you tell me what happened that day? I was uh, I was picking up the mushrooms as always. And then the next day, it just hurt. Did you brush up against something or did someone drop something in your arm? Yep. Well, uh Yes, but yes, yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, so I want to make sure that you know that you're completely safe here, right? Um, and if someone came with you, I'm not going to share any of the things that you told me with that person, okay? And I want to take care of your arm, but even more than that, I want to take care of you. Okay. Okay. Uh, he 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 told me he, you were going to tell him 
um, what happened? Well, I can, I, if you give me permission, I can share with him instructions for caring for your burn. Um, when it, but only if you give me permission. The law does not allow me to tell him anything about what you said. But he's not going to go to jail because the burns, right? I don't have any control over the police, and right now my biggest concern is taking care of you. So let's get this cleaned up, um, and let's see how deep that burn is, and then we'll talk about how to make it better, and then we'll talk through all of the different people okay. and, and, and any, anything that needs to happen, okay? Okay. Do you feel safe here right now? Yes. Okay. See what I mean? I keep forgetting to do this. <laughs> um, okay, good. Now, my nurse is going to come in, and she's going to help get this cleaned up. Okay? She, she is absolutely wonderful, and she's not going to talk to anybody either. Right? She's standing right over there, and she's an amazing young woman. Okay. okay? Um, and she is bound by the law as well. She cannot tell the person who came with you what we're doing or why. She cannot do that, okay? Not without your permission. Okay. Um, I might have other like this in here too. Okay. Well, we will take a look at all of those spots, clean them up, and take care of you. Okay. I'm going to end the role play now. You get the idea. Um, first, I want to hear from our patient how she felt about the encounter. Well, I felt really nervous because you know, I have somebody outside who did this, burn, cigarette burns. Um, she's, she's got it written on here that this is a burn, that's how I know. <laughs> <laughs> and like the cigarette burns in here, like in circles. Um, because I, I have seen that happen. Um, and uh, this trustful, but kind of wanted to, in this case, wanted to believe the physician, which is doing a good job um, making me feel more comfortable. Of course, I'm lying about how I got this first and what other parts of my body I have. I was hoping that they would give me some medication here and then keep, you know, use the same medication for the rest of the body. I don't want, uh, you know, the outside people to know because I'm going to get more burns or probably worse. Um, and likely, uh, I will go back to work, but knowing that there is a door open here, uh, but I'm not sure. Comments or questions from the audience? Yes? I want to ask something. Yes. And of course we need to repeat the question, but um, when would you say something to her that you say your radar has gone up on mm -hmm. maybe this is trafficking. How would you start to approach that with her? So that's a great segue into two slides from now. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so her question was, if I suspected this was trafficking, um, <laughs> how would I begin to question her about that? And we are going to talk about that in a couple of slides. But I really think this is more about meeting your patient where they are and you know her concern is her arm and the burn on her arm and getting medical attention for that. Of course I have this other agenda that I'm developing as she's answering questions, but it's most important that I deal with what she came in for first rather than diverting my attention to what I am most worried about and then having her fear that I'm not actually going to take care of her arm. Yes? So at what point Well, I would, I would just ask the question. So the question was, how would I separate whether this is trafficking from domestic abuse versus, you know, whatever it could be, right? I don't know at this point what I'm dealing with, right? I know that based on what the burn looks like and the fact that she's telling me she has it in other parts of her body and it looks like cigarette burns, that another person has done this to her. So I know it is, uh, it is abuse, right? 
um, and its trauma and that I need to get to the bottom of the story. First, I'm gonna take care of the medical needs because that's why she came in, right? She didn't come in to tell me her story. I'm not the police station, she didn't come in to report it, but I don't know. And so I think you say, so tell me more about how this happened. And then what was happening before that happened? And see if you can get her to disclose parts of the story that would give you a clue, but I don't think you know. And, and that's part of the issue here is we never know what we're going to uncover. Um, yes, we're teaching you about trafficking because we want it to be on your radar, but I don't actually know what I'm gonna find. And I'm often surprised by what I find. Well, less surprised more and more now. Um, but, you know, the truth is I just really never know what I'm going to find. Well, and then, like, I know, you know, child abuse, elder abuse is mandatory to report, but domestic is always voluntary. So at this point, and her being, like, afraid of what's going on and, you know, the mm -hmm. bad stuff, you know, how would you help her feel comfortable in taking care of her legally? So I would just ask her, so how old are you, Graciela? Um, 22. Okay, so and I don't really know whether she looks younger than her stated age, because she's actually not 22. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a real, oh, I, I thought the character. <laughs> I did mean the character. Oh. So, you know, I think it depends. So I need to identify when, when I'm a mandatory reporter, but I'm doing that in my head, right? And I'm probably taking some notes, but being really careful about my notes. Um, and trying to sort through that. I would ask her what her needs are because I think that patient identified needs are really where we, where, where we should be helping. Because after all, all we really wanna do is help this person to whatever the next step is for them. And as she said, she's probably not gonna tell me the story today and she's gonna leave. But then at least she's identified a person in the community who seemed sort of safe and maybe she'll come back. And I have the advantage as a primary care physician of people having the ability to come back and see me. That's not always the case in the emergency room, although I know you see lots and lots of repeat people um, because they don't have access to health care otherwise. It's just delving deeper and deeper and deeper. In my experience um, in, as a primary care doc, I really think that, you know, it's highly unlikely that people will disclose on the first visit. It's usually four, five, six, seven times later that they tell me the story and you etch away at it, um, you don't get the whole story all at once. And you know that from taking care of patients, right? But even still, like, they have to say, I want to report it. Right, and I would say, do you, know, do you want to report this yeah. when we got that far? Okay. So, okay, all right, yes. At what point as a nurse do you stop asking those questions and they just the provider to keep asking those questions? Like, is there a line where it's inappropriate for the nurses to be asking these questions? Or there, so she's asking about if there's a line between nurse and provider and you know how far should she go as a nurse um, in asking these questions um, so first of all it depends on who you're working with right and what their skill set is and you know that better than anybody else does you also know who gets angry at you for asking questions that they think they should have asked um, but I think a lot of education is needed for those people who have any issues at all with you asking any question um, I would love to work with nurses who could practically do my job for me and I didn't really need to do very much and I could just breeze in and say, here's a prescription. No, I really don't want that. But, but you know, I really think we have to build a team and it doesn't matter who on the team is asking the questions. I mean, my nurses in private practice were very well trained. One um, was an RN and the other one was a medical assistant that, well, she was a patient. And then we sent her to school for six weeks to get her six week medical assistant certificate thing. And then my nurse trained her to do what she needed her to do so that I could have Trina doing more. And then we just kept that up over the years to the point where there were times when I was irrelevant. And that was my goal. Um, so I say there's no line. Um, it's just the people that you're working with and if they are quirky. And then if they're quirky, you need to educate them. Hi, Graciela. I'm Dr. Harrison. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah, thank you. What can I do for you today? Um, I have some, um, I guess, uh, an infection. Um, and so I want some medication, you know. Okay, well, we can definitely tend to that for you, okay? 
Not a problem. Now, I'm sorry, I missed your age. How old are you? 19, 20. Okay, so you just had a birthday? Well, I'm going to be 20 soon. Okay, well, happy birthday in advance. Thank you. So now, where is this infection that you're worried about? Um, right here. Okay, and is it on the inside or the outside? I think both. Okay. Well, you know, we're definitely going to have to take a look and examine that part of you. Okay? Yeah. Are you all right with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, did the nurse have you um, give us a urine sample before you came in? Yep. Excellent. Well, we're going to go ahead and test that okay. for a couple of different things. Um, we can test it for a couple of sexually transmitted infections. We could test for urinary tract infection, and we can check to see if you're pregnant. Okay? Yeah. And so I'll have those test results in just, you know, the, at least the last two in just a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, can I ask you a couple of other questions? Sure. How long has this been bothering you? Hmm. This time, uh, two weeks. Okay. And do you have a discharge? Yeah. What does it look like? Uh, terrible. Just <laughs> terrible. Okay. Kind of, yeah, yeah. You will see. All right. Okay. Well, I will see that. All yeah. right. Um, are you having pain? Yeah. All right. Is the pain just in your vagina and around the outside, or is it up in your belly? All of it. All right, okay. All right, well, I will check more when we do the exam. Um, how many sexual partners have you had um, in the last month? Well, partners, partners, I mean, month, three, four, uh, probably five a week. Okay, all right. And are you able to use a condom for disease protection? Not all the time. Okay. All right, so I'm going to come back and ask you more questions about that a little bit later. What about um, birth control? Well, not, not really. I mean, sometimes I forget and, you know. So do you have birth control pills at home? Uh, yeah, supposedly, but... Okay, well maybe we'll talk about better ways to protect you from pregnancy. Yeah. If that's something that you're interested in. I, I am. Okay, all right. Okay, well let's go ahead and do your exam, but um, I want to figure out what's going on, but then I want to come back and talk about some of these issues in a little bit more detail. Um, before we do the exam, I do have one question for you. Um, do you feel like you have a choice and you can say no to having sex with someone? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, but then I, 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 you know, I have to pay the bills and, you know, so, I mean, possible, but I know my situation, I have to pay the bills and, you know, the house and all that, so. Okay, so it sounds like you're trading sex for money. Yeah, 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 you could say that, yeah. And do you have any control over this money that you're earning? Well, I mean, not, not really. I mean, <laughs> I wish you all the money for me, but I have to pay the rent and, you know, uh, you know, my boyfriend is also taking care of me. So then, you know, he needs to, nobody's going to be, you know, just giving me money like that. Both of us are working, so we have to, Okay, all right. Well, again, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, one more question before we do your exam. Do you feel safe to share information with me here today? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, cool. All right, okay. And again, how old did you say you are? 19, almost 20. Okay, all right. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and set, get you set up for the exam. And then once we examine you and figure out what's going on, I'm gonna have you put your clothes back on and then we'll resume our conversation. Okay. okay? All right. Comments? Graciela? <laughs> okay, so uh, I represented somebody that, well, a few people, more than a few, um, survivors that I know, uh, well, they were not acting like that, that was my own characterization. Uh, but basically, uh, coming like is, is okay, uh, to do dancing or doing this 
uh, is under my control. Uh, I am um, giving money, you were right on track, uh, giving money to my boyfriend to protect me, that eventually that boyfriend is also working with a couple people. Uh, and eventually, you know, I will realize that something is not right, which is my boyfriend is not really my boyfriend. Um, so that does come to the idea that I am not ready. I am not identifying myself as a victim. I get the illusion that um, that I am in control. It's cool right now. I'm doing it for a couple years, and then we're going to be okay. So not that uncommon a situation, and you know, depending, I mean, she's being trafficked, right? Being trafficked by this boyfriend, um, or being prostituted by her boyfriend, whatever language you decide. And honestly, I don't think it matters as long as you are clear about the law and what the law calls it. If she's truly 19, um, then there's no, actually no law, and Robin's gonna go over this at the end, that you are a mandated reporter for an adult who's being trafficked, right? But if she's 17, then it's child abuse, and then you're a mandated reporter. So um, this would be a good situation, you know, if, if you didn't believe that she was 19, to check the missing persons database and see if her picture pops up, um, because then you would have some recourse and some mandatory reporting, and perhaps could deal with it. Although, you know, these situations unfold dynamically, and I don't know the answers ever to what's going to happen and what I should do. So just trust your best judgment and call for help when you need it. Um, one thing that is important to me as a, as a victim is that when she was asking questions, I didn't feel there was any judgment on it. I mean, it was just questions that she needed to know. It wasn't any face or any mm, or, or anything like that. So I know that I can come back here and, and then I will not be judged. And that's really important. So if you cannot um, disguise your surprise, um, then somebody else needs to be the person who asks the questions. And to your point, if the physician or nurse practitioner or PA that you're working with is one of those people who says, oh my God, um, then maybe you should ask the questions and not that person, right? Um, and you know that. Okay, so there are some questions up here. So there was a question about what, what I would ask. And I don't know what I'm gonna ask. So these are the kinds of questions that I ask, right? So are you comfortable? And then attending to what their immediate needs are. Again, patient identified agenda comes first. Um, is there someone here with you today? Are you safe? Can we talk alone safely? Um, and I think that gets to Graciela's point earlier about being concerned that the phone may be used as a recording device or it may actually be on speakerphone. And so that question can get at that if you ask a secondary question. Um, do you have a place to stay? Do you have a person that you can call? Um, has anyone threatened you or your family? Um, and then, th again, this is after we get into the reasons behind the visit. Um, these are not initial questions of um, any medical encounter. Um, and then getting at violence, you know, has anybody ever hit you, forced you to do something you didn't want to do? Um, and you can rephrase these questions in a way that feels comfortable for you. It is really important that we use our own language and that we, as, as best we can, we reflect the patient's own language without using a lot of vulgarities. But you really, that's part of meeting the patient where they are, is not using a script but really asking them questions that seem appropriate in the moment. Um, and we have another video for you here. I've left the life several times, and he would show up at my job. He would show up at my school. He would threaten to hurt my sisters. So after a while, you just realize it's not worth it. And so she stayed because she was afraid her sister was going to be next, her younger sister. All right. So if you are really suspicious that this is trafficking, these are some of the secondary screening questions that you can ask. Do you work and sleep in the same place? So in my story about some of the women that are trafficked for sex in South Florida, they're sleeping in the same place where they're being trafficked for sex. But in some of Robin's examples, you know, restaurant workers, nail salons, massage parlors, maybe they're sleeping on the kitchen floor in the back of the restaurant. 
Um, you go into a restaurant that looks kind of sketchy, ask yourselves these questions. Is this a place where people might be being trafficked? You're mandatory reporters in all phases of your life, not just when you're at work. Remember that. Um, have you traded sex for anything? It might be money, it might be food, it might be drugs, it might be a place to sleep, right? Shelter. Do you owe a debt for employment? Back to Graciela's slides about um, this fallacy that um, they owe money for their jobs, um, for being smuggled, and then that gets doubled or tripled once they start working. And does someone else control your identification documents? Now these last couple are not questions that I often ask right up front. I mean, those are not things that I'm dealing with as a provider. I um, assume the front desk is asking those or something like that, right? But if you are a team and you know the people that are at the front desk, if they're suspicious about something, they can come and tell you that, right? Keep our lines of communication open so that we know when we need to follow up on questions. So when we separate things by job and then we don't talk to each other, we often get into trouble because we don't get the whole story. So that's why I was so excited that there was a ward secretary here. Um, who was it? Who's the ward secretary? You? Is that what they still call them? Unit secretary. Unit secretary. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm displaying my age here. <laughs> All right. Um, and then there was, and an, in the unlikely situation that someone tells you, right, whether it's disclosure about trafficking or something else, make sure that you re reiterate the things that you know, that this is not their fault, that, um, that they don't deserve this, and that we are there to help, right? We are there to give them assistance. It might be getting resources. It might be calling your social worker in the emergency room to see what resources can be invoked for this person. Uh, it might be connecting with staff and then sending a victim advocate um, to pick up the pieces where the emergency room leaves off. We are all there to help. Um, and make a connection. You know, if this is a runaway, who is now on the missing persons database, maybe there's someone that they can call, an aunt, a mom, a dad, a brother, an uncle, somebody safe, um, where they could more easily extract themselves from the situation. Um, I don't want any of you to feel like you're rescuing anyone. This is not a rescue situation, even though we call this, because these people need to, need to realize that it's time to leave. Um, if we extract them from the situation forcibly, they're more likely to go back. So they need to be ready, just like with anything else. Um, and then if they are ready to call, even if it's just to get information, make sure they're using a phone in the office. Your cell phone is fine, um, as long as you know who they're calling, right? Um, but don't ever let them use their own phone to make a call to the hotline, to a shelter, to anywhere, because those phones can be tracked, okay? Um, go back, because there is a video where it says, how can I help? That's a video. If I was a doctor and I'd be asking questions, um, my first question would be, are you okay? It, it seems like a dumb question or, uh, or just simple, but sometimes it, it can make you break down and really think about it. Because if somebody would ask me, if, am I okay? I would have actually broke down. If a healthcare provider asks the right questions, in an environment that's not judgmental and where a message is being communicated that this is being asked to help the individual, um, in many cases a victim will be able to disclose what her experience has been. If a young person does decide to disclose, you're not shock to everything that they're saying and reacting in the moment um, because a young person doesn't take that as goodness, you need some more training around this issue, they take it as you're reacting to me, you're disgusted by me, right? You're shocked by what I'm telling you. The judgmental look is very powerful. It, it might not be to some people, but it makes you feel very small, very, uh, like you're not needed, like you're just disgusting. Okay, so um, we're going to be talking about safety assessment, and that has to do with how you ask the questions and what kind of questions you ask them. From there, and uh, for my colleagues, uh, uh, social workers here, uh, assessing the, the safety is very important because when that person leaves the hospital, uh, hopefully they will have some idea, uh, as much as they were able to tell you, uh, about how to uh, reduce the risk of uh, 
of the uh, violence or whatever they are suffering. And it depends on the case. Uh, it really goes uh, case by case. Um, here there is some uh, questions. Uh, of course, when we said is the trafficker outside in the waiting room, we don't mean you know, we're not going to ask that. We, you know, what, how, where, what, uh, how the person uh, addressed the, the, the person outside, that's how we're we going to ask. Is your ba a boyfriend outside or is your family causing member outside? So we start kind of getting an idea what's going on. And uh, also I want to, to clarify the last uh, question that is there any history of uh, drugs or alcohol abuse? The way to ask that is uh, do you receive any compensation or any, um, or, or the uh, boyfriend provides you with alcohol or drugs? Uh, and it's not a judgmental question, it's just a simple question that you can, you can ask. So based on what this person is telling you, then you will, you know, do a couple advices, even, even if it is two advices uh, uh, for the safety planning, for example, you suspect this person is in a hotel and um, and then there is it might be violence there. So I will I will tell, you know, the uh, nineteen year old, almost 20, 20 year old uh, woman there that if there is any issues she needs to run out in the hall where people can see her or people you know, uh, other uh, room people can hear her or people can see her. So I'm trying to avoid, you know, being killed in the room. Um, it is, and for, for all of you that have been taking the training of uh, domestic violence and sexual violence, you know, those safety tips is the ones that we are trying to, to tell you uh, for, for victims of uh, human trafficking. Um, then we are going to the next, Human trafficking recognition. All right. So, um, so you've got a patient, and you have amazingly identified that they're a victim of human trafficking, and you've talked to them. You've done a, safe, a brief safety assessment. You've called the social worker, and it's time to connect to resources. So that's the next step. If they want resources, and even if they don't, under, explaining to them what the resources are that's available is really important. I don't expect this to be your job. Go ahead and go on to the next slide. Oh, we're there. Hey, I just didn't look up. All right, so from my perspective as a clinician, I do not think that I'm the answer to anything, right? And I think that's really important. So I can identify information, I can identify risk, but it, I can't solve the problems that got that person in that situation. But I know people who can, and so I view myself as a link to those resources. Um, I know who to call, and I think it behooves all of us to know who to call, and that's really the next step. Know where the limits are of your job, and know when it's time to call that next person. Also know when it's time to step in, because it's not quite going right. Um, I think the important thing is here to make sure that the patient knows that they're not alone and there's help available um, in all sorts of forms. Um, and I think we're gonna go over that on the next slide, which is Graciela again, right? Oh, good, thank you. I'm popular here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what I will be doing is uh, coming and uh, and then ask for uh, you know are you thirsty? Uh, are you hungry? If the person needs an interpreter, I will link those services or I will do the translation. Uh, if the person needs uh, an attorney because the situation, whether it's immigration issue. Or um, is now we have, uh, for example, one of our clients uh, need to have the, her records expunged. So it's not the immigration issue, it's another kind of attorney. So then I, I connect those services. Uh, even housing uh, or um, sometimes they, they go to the hospital and they get the prescription from you guys and then who's going to pay for that prescription if it is not being paid or is not being free. So then I connect those services. And income assistance should be on the second long-term assistance. Um, so then I, you know, with a long-term, I'm going to start establishing better uh, 
you know, rapport and keep understanding uh, the situation. As Dr. Harrison said before, um, the, the, the story and what happened to this person very likely is not going to be disclosed in the first 20 times that you see this person. It's going to be more and more, and that's the, the usual thing. So then you will understand that there's an addition things that you can do, as for example, bringing the kids from another country to here, which we have done it. So then what does that include, the attorney and coordination with other, uh, actually, uh, agencies from other organizations from other countries. Um, and then, of course, we try to find trauma-informed counseling uh, and possible substance abuse. So that, that's coming as, as a secondary and even more. Uh, one thing really fast that I want to mention is um, when, uh, when we um, come and, and, and help somebody, that help doesn't go in the next month or in, in this. It comes really you know, for years. Uh, it is a lot of uh, a lot of work to do, and it is challenging. Uh, but we are ready. We we have been doing it. So, as Graciela just said, this is what Stack is here in the community to do. Everything that was on that slide and more. It could also include trying to find someone to remove a tattoo or any number of things. And I wanted to just again harken you back to this card, um, also to our website because we have a directory of services there. So you could um, go right to that, never even have to call us if you look on that directory and see everything from various law enforcement contacts to um, social services contacts. Um, these are all people on our directory, on our website, who have said they have something, you know, they can contribute in this area, they have some knowledge and expertise, and they're there to assist you. But now also, when you call our number, 597-2080, this is what we will do. We will come here and we work arm in arm with other service providers. So while someone may be sheltered at Refuge House or at the Homeless Coalition or at the Hope Community, or if someone is, is receiving a service at Disc Village, what we've done with them is said, hey, call us and let us give you value added. We want everybody to be more educated about trafficking. When they see a victim, they'll know what to do. When they suspect they see a victim, they'll know what to do. But then they'll call us for assistance. And at the same time, um, there's the information. We have a national human trafficking hotline number that Stack is also a referral source on that. So I just want to leave you, we're kind of getting closer to the end of our program, but I wanted to leave you with that information to know that this link to services that Dr. Harrison talked about, that's what we're here for. <clears throat> and just to elaborate a little more on what Robin <coughs> was discussing, um, as you see there's a part that says follow institutional protocols. And that is something that we are actively working on at this time, um, specifically with the emergency department and the leadership team there, but maybe eventually it could be something that would go housewide. Uh, what we are doing is we're going to be implementing the adult human trafficking screening tool, which um, has been provided for you guys to look over. Um, it's important that we're using it um, in ways that Dr. Harrison uh, was discussing that it's appropriate, not something where you're gonna just go down a checklist and ask questions, but something that once you've established rapport, you can um, guide which questions may be pertinent to your patient and, and start working on those next steps. Now, we'll also be creating a sort of protocol of what to do when you do uh, suspect a victim. In the case of the emergency department, it's something that we'll be placing in the assistant nurse manager folder as a reference so that if you forget some of the information today, you'll have a quick reference that can help guide you on what to do next. I think overall the, the big take home is that we have great resources here in Tallahassee with the Survive and Thrive Advocacy Center and they're here to help. If you call the National Human Trafficking Hotline, they will refer you to them. Um, they'll also can come and help you know, remove the a patient and take the patient to safety for you. So just to add on to this, um, in my experience, it's best, um, I want to see my patients back, right? I want to, I want to know the rest of the story. Um, I always make an appointment for the patient before they leave the exam room. I do not send them to the waiting room to make a follow-up appointment. I do not leave that task to somebody else unless they're going to come in the room and do it on the computer that's sitting there. Um, their abuser, their trafficker may be in the waiting room, and that may not be a safe place. Um, healthcare appointments are generally received well, um, and you know, I mean, you can say follow up for anything, right? Mm -hmm. Make it up, don't care, but make that appointment before they leave the room. 
Okay. I have to say, I am so completely impressed with, I think somebody over here said, I think it was you, there is no mandatory reporting for domestic violence, so thank you very much. I have trained rooms and rooms of physicians, which no offense, but they still think there is. Um, nurses, they got it going on. I know they do. Yeah. Um, so uh, so this, these two slides, you, you, the details are on your um, PowerPoint copy. Um, just like with domestic violence, there is no mandatory reporting for human trafficking as a phenomenon. So um, the place where you do have mandatory reporting, though, is the um, when there is a life-threatening injury or a gunshot wound. And again, your institutional protocols, no doubt, deal with that. That is a mandatory report to the local sheriff, to Walt McNeil's office, to Sheriff McNeil, when you see life-threatening of any kind. It may result, it may have come about because of domestic violence or human trafficking or other kinds of abuse, or it may be a one-shot deal, literally. Um, but that is a mandatory report to the sheriff. So that's your mandatory reporting for this, for DV, for any other kinds of um, situations. Unless the person, the patient you're seeing is a vulnerable adult or a child. Um, so if you see human trafficking, know that um, DCF has a special reporting procedure for children who are trafficked, labor or sex trafficked. When you call DCF, even if you just suspect it, and chances are with a child or with a vulnerable adult, you're not gonna see just trafficking. You're gonna see um, maybe sexual abuse, maybe physical abuse, maybe neglect. You're gonna see other harms to that individual that would constitute a reason why you would call anyway. But what my plea is to all of you today is when you do make that call to DCF, as well as to law enforcement, say, I think it might, you know what, I just had this great two hour course on trafficking. I think this might be human trafficking. I can't say for sure, but it just came across me as, as struck me as, as these, you know, these things were said, made me think it might be trafficking. Because what that will do with DCF is it'll, it'll make it a more urgent call for them. They may call law enforcement right away. You may get better services and make better responses for that individual. Here in Leon <laughs> County, we have a special human trafficking training investigator, or human, human trafficking investigator with DCF. So that would trigger her involvement, which again, that will get more immediate help to all of you. So know that that's important to, to note and that those numbers have been going up. So that's the, any questions on the reporting piece? I have a question. Yeah. Um, and, and I've heard you say this on several, um, several presentations and I think about it every time and never ask. Why does sheriff and not TPD? Um, because there are 67 sheriffs and the way the law was originally was it was always the sheriff because we know we're going to have jurisdiction, clear jurisdiction of the county. It makes it easier for folks as opposed to go in Miami Day. There's 17,000 municipalities, right? So who would I call if they, you know? So it's the county. Okay. Um, I think we're nearing the end. Documentation. Do you want to say anything about this? Okay. So you know about documentation. You clearly need to have um, have everything. Com uh, detailed. If you think somebody's lying, put that in quotes. Don't not put it in there because even somebody lying um, to you, that is a survival strategy for somebody and speaking as an attorney, I can tell you that the more information that's in a record, a patient record, the better it's going to be for that person. It can help them later, not just with the prosecution, help the system, not just with the prosecution of that trafficker or that abuser. It will also be evidence that this is what the person said and did because she was under such duress that she had to lie. She did lie. That was part of her getting through this part of, and we used to call it the batter woman syndrome in the domestic violence world, but it's important to do that. Taking pictures is vital, um, documenting the injuries completely, documenting that the injuries might be inconsistent with what the patient said. These are all very important things to do, um, and it will help in any number of ways that person have evidence of abuse so that they can access relief and other benefits, not just in civil actions or in court cases, but through the, um, you know, through getting other kinds of immigration benefits, immigration statuses. We haven't talked about this, but trafficking victims from another country, they're eligible to receive something called a T visa, possibly. Um, people who are victims of crime who are here. They can be eligible to be um, U visa recipients. And these are, these are complicated areas of the law, but we have individuals here in the community that we work with that have great expertise around these areas. 
So again, you're not clearly an immigration law. I'm not, I'm aware I'm not an immigration law expert, but we can have access to those folks. And we have a video. My vision now is, my eyes are hoping now, I want, I want to finish school, I want to have a good job, I, I want to become a nurse. And uh, I honestly, doing, being in the life kind of messes your head with the whole male having a relationship and everything, but I still believe in love. I still want to get married. I want to have kids. I want, I want a normal life. So there's hope. Um, that little clip was called Hope. Um, and that's really vitally important. Another real a quick law, we didn't do a lot on the law, but I want to tell you when she said, I want to be a nurse, um, I've met with a nurse who was trafficked as a child, and she said, you know, the thing I kept running into was I, I used drugs and I had a, a criminal record. And it happened during um, the uh, time that I was trafficked. So we have a part of Florida law that says you can actually get that record expunged. Any arrest or conviction, um, if it's committed during the time someone is trafficked and we have attorneys available uh, to help with that. So, so that is I part of it. I just wanted to say one thing before we go on. Sorry. Yeah. We're go ahead. Really fast. I, I need a little clarification. So let's say a 25 year old um, female comes in and I suspect human trafficking. So it's not, doesn't fall under mandatory reporting. What about HIPAA? What about HIPAA? How do you get this woman help or do you not unless she specifically- You're not violating HIPAA by invoking resources. You have her permission to do that. That, well, that was my question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, if, if so she's 25. She's so the question was, if it's a 25 person who's not, doesn't fall into the category where you're a mandatory reporter, then what? And, and worried about HIPAA violations. So um, at every point with an adult patient that has an agency, we ask their permission, right? When they give it, that's not a HIPAA violation. So if, she's, if, it, if it seems very evident that she is a victim, but she says, no, thank you, I'm fine, then that's... I would still give her, I would have her memorize the human trafficking hotline number, 888-3737-888. It's super simple, um, even with someone who is um, currently um, impeded by substances. It's pretty easy, and I just have them repeat that several times. I do not write it down. I do not give them this piece of paper um, or text to be free. Um, those will get the, you right to the hotline. And then when she decides she's ready, at least she has the information. So the point, the reason I took the microphone from Robin is because I, one of, this is one of my pet peeves. It's not on a slide, but maybe it should be, is the judgmental language that I read in charts. It drives me crazy. So there is never a place for us to be judgmental in a chart. We document the facts as we see them. And if someone, I mean, <coughs> taking it out of the trafficking abuse realm, I frequently see, you know, patient is non-compliant. Um, well, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean they didn't get a prescription? Well, that's not them being non-compliant, right? Um, does it mean somebody took their prescription away? Does it mean they didn't understand? Does it mean they didn't agree with you in the first place and never intended to take the prescription, but it was the easiest way to get away from you was to take the piece of paper and leave? Um, or now that we transmit electronically, just, just never go to the pharmacy, or maybe they didn't have a ride to the pharmacy. But I see judgmental language in the charts all the time. Um, so since nurses are better at this than other people, being doctor types, um, I, I put it upon you to try to coach people a little bit about what they write in the chart. Um, I mean, I had a situation pretty recently um, where a colleague was in the Northeast Emergency Room um, for abdominal pain, and two days later he came to the TMH Emergency Room, the main emergency room, because um, the problem wasn't resolved and was not improving and he was getting worse. And the first thing the physician said in the emergency room was, well, I just assumed you were a drug seeker since you were at the Northeast um, emergency room two days ago, rather than thinking maybe we didn't do our job and there's really a deeper problem here. Um, and I could go on and tell you the rest of the story, but it, it just made me really angry. And it's an example, it's something that I see all the time in charts. So please be careful about documentation. Who has this slide? Um, I do, but we've actually, we've talked about all this. So just know there's information on the back table. There's more information you can get online. Please take any copies that are out there with you. Um, take as many, take them back to your units. 
Um, and we've talked about everything here, I believe. So I would say know that that information is there. I have um, one more of these sheets. We have the sticky notes. We have information about joining our coalition, and you have our information. So with mandatory that, mandatory signage. Say something about signage. Uh, mandatory mm -hmm. signage, definitely. You know, all of the the two scenarios. What I kept thinking was what we could have had was information in the waiting room, um, in the bathroom, in any place, in your examining rooms, wherever it's convenient like this so someone could possibly have seen it and known that's a place where they could get information. And Okay, and we also have lots of free information online. The federal government has a lot of stuff you can one thing that has helped me open up over time was seeing pamphlets about sex trafficking and seeing um, just reading them in the hospital. I, I've seen them in hospitals and it doesn't necessarily make you talk to the doctor right away but it makes you realize that it is something that people may understand and it makes you while reading it it makes you realize the situation that you're in and the help that is available. So thank you all so much. We'll conclude here. I'll thank all my co-presenters. Um, thank you. We'll be here for a little bit if you have any questions or comments. And um, again, good luck with everything and keep, keep us in mind as a resource for you.